Okay, well, this is Dr. Morton, and I'm uh, going to uh, I'm going to uh, record the video here uh, to help you get the uh, your uh, your tilt table uh, PID controller implemented. I may have to. Well, there's one feature I have not implemented yet, and that's that's going to be a little bit of a problem. So, uh, so. Uh, uh, what I need to do is I need to get some way for you to measure time so that you can have a, an accurate time stamp each time you, um, uh, you, you take a position reading of the ball. And the reason for this is that even though we're doing that with interrupts and whatnot, and it's, it, comes, it, it comes up uh, fairly routinely, there still are some little glitches in the timing, and, and it will make it a lot more accurate if we actually have some independent time standard that's uh, that's keeping time for us. We have a couple of options. We can use the uh, the periodic interrupt timer or we can use the system tick timer. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, part of the actual ARM M0 plus core. It's not one of the Freescale peripherals that they added. Uh, and then the other one is one of the Freescale peripherals. And I, I'm going to implement one or the other. I'm not sure which. Uh, or if I can't do that, I'll just implement a timer. Uh, we'll use the uh, we'll, we'll, we'll use one of the timers and we'll just use that. In any event, um, we, need, we need something to keep time. So just make a note. We're, we'll come back to that. I'll talk about that. Hopefully I'll get that done this week and early next, and I'll talk about that next week. Uh, but in the meantime, you can go ahead and, and, and you, can, you can sort of um, you, can, you can sort of just use a standard you can assume a standard amount of time between samples, uh, and and you can just use that. It, it and uh, that would give you a little bit of a uh, that would give you a, uh, some some basis for your differential term. All right, so we'll go through this and explain it. I want to talk a little bit about kind of control theory. Not much. We'll touch on it a little bit so you can at least kind of understand what this looks like if you take a control course. All right, so uh, I'm going to review this. We've talked about this before. So the touch panel, you know it's a resistive touch panel. It has four wires. They're actually, ours come off in the center, but they're all different. And, uh, and uh, one, each wire connect, there's, a, there's a, an electrode, so well, there's two panels. There's a, uh, both panels have a resistive coating. Uh, I forget whether the top or the bottom, but, but in any event, uh, there's, a, there's a connection here and a connection here to this resistive coating on the top panel. And it connects to this electrode here so that when the, these are sandwiched together, uh, this wire then can be connected to this end, and then the other wire can, can be connected to this end. And that gives us our, our X direction. Then we have another resistive coating here on the bottom piece, uh, along with some little spacer dots. And we have an electrode on, on, the, on the back and an electrode on the front. Uh, depending, depending on how you want to label it. And so, so we've, we've called, called this, uh, we've, we've called this, this I think we've set it up um, back, front, left, right. And the idea is then that the left front corner is zero, zero, and the top front corner we just arbitrarily uh, designated as 2000, 2000. Now that's our scale. We have to, we have to actually scale the raw value we read off the panel because the raw value is going to be a resistance reading that's going to vary from roughly 0 to 4095 because we're using 12 bits. And because that's 0 to 4095 this way and 0 to 4095 this way, we're going to have to scale that so that it works out to be 0 to 2000 instead. Because, uh, and then hopefully what you can do is, is get a little graph paper and kind of lay it over your touch panel and sort of try and get a Pick a nice point here that's the extreme corner, but still actually inside the area where the touch, where the, where the resistive coating is applied. Because you can get outside of that near where the electrodes are and you're going to get funky readings. So make sure you stay kind of inside. And you can see there's, it's, it's where it kind of gets a little gray here, right inside that corner. And then you want to do the exact same amount here and here and here, and then find the center as accurately as you can uh, and mark that. And, and then, then you'll, you'll want to, what you want to make, make sure is the distance between this point and this point is you just arbitrarily decide is 2,000 units. 
and you want whatever that distance is, you want that same actual physical distance between the two dots up here, uh, and then the distance between the top and the bottom on your point should be the same on the left side as it is on the right side. Uh, and then try and find that center as accurately as you can. We may decide to do some points around the center to improve our calibration. Maybe 750, the center is at 1,000, 1,000, and then so this would be 750, um, uh, 1,000 uh, y, uh, and this would be uh, say uh, 1,250 uh, uh, x and uh, 1,000 y, and then you have a point up here that would be uh, uh, 1,250 y and 1,000 x, and this would be 1,000 x and uh, 750 y. So you can add some points if you want, and just increase the uh, uh, change your MATLAB routine to just accommodate, uh, 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 you know, nine points instead of the five points. In any event, uh, make, make sure you correctly uh, modify your x and y vectors as well. All right. So when there's a touch. We're gonna we're gonna have we're gonna multiplex this thing. First, we're gonna put a zero and three point three volts across the top, and then we'll we'll be listening, to, uh, we'll be connecting one of the bottom electrodes uh, to the A to D. Of course, we leave it connected all the time to the A to D, uh, and we do the same with the top. But we're gonna read the we're gonna tri-state the 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 GPIO outputs, and we're just gonna read the uh, the, the A to D value off the bottom. Uh, uh, conductive surface off the electrode edge. Then we'll tri-state these uh, GPIO puts, ports, set these up for 0 and 3.3 volts, and then we'll be listening on one of these pads up here with our A to D converter. And so we, we do the A to D conversion first here and get an X reading, we do the A to D conversion up here and get a Y reading, and we have to switch, uh, we have to s reverse our um, uh, which panel? Which panel we're applying our our our, our electric field to? Basically, our voltage, um, and this just creates a voltage divider, and it, and it works pretty well, essentially like this. Uh, yes, we do have a little resistance on the panel we're reading, but remember, so little current flows into the A to D converter that uh, that this resistance doesn't really come into play. So we really just wind up reading the voltage from this voltage converter. The, and, and because these G, the GPIO ports are tri-stated when we're doing this reading, they're not uh, they're not putting out any any ground they're not putting out ground in 3.3 volts. Only these electrodes are. So the one of these is connected uh, to the A to D converter, and that 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 resistance in that link doesn't really matter as long as very little current's flowing through it. And since the A to D converter charges up a a little sample capacitor that's a few picofarads. Uh, there's very little current, and all you have to do is wait a, a small amount of time, and you let the capacitor charge up, and then any current effect flowing through this resistor will be completely gone, and you'll pretty much read that, that potential. And that's why we put a little bit of delay uh, from when we change the channel to where we actually read it. Okay. Yeah, so, so, yeah. Um, and we're, here are the ports we're using. Uh, the GPIO ports are port B8, 9, 10, and 11. And the, the two servo outputs are B1 and 0 and 1. And the two A to D inputs are B2 and 3. So we're just using all B ports. Um, so uh, we used to do this with the battery. Uh, we don't do this anymore. Now we actually take the 7.2 volts. We have a buck down converter. We switch it to 6.5 or 6.3 to 6.5, so we're not overpowering the servos, and this one on resistor did not work very well. It was a big problem. Okay, um, here's how it's connected, and I, so when I did it before, I, I made the center zero, and, and we used, uh, you know, we basically used, uh, you know, minus one, minus one, plus one, plus one, essentially. Uh, this time we're going to do uh, zero zero and, and two thousand two thousand, and we're gonna that way we can do more of an inter, integer thing. Although we still do that, actually we have to run our controller using floating point anyway. So I don't know. I probably should have stuck with this, but that's what I did. Um, okay. So um, 
And, and here's the way they're connected. Uh, 10 is connected to the back, 8's to the left, 11's to the front, and 9's to the right. So that's how it works. And our two uh, A to D lines are connected to the back and the left electrodes. And they're connected all the time, but we're only sampling the one that's tri-stated, obviously, because if we sample the one that's being driven to ground or 3.3 volts, then that's the value we read. So it wouldn't work very well. We have to power these GPIO tri-state the front back ones and list and, and feed the A to D sample on the A to D connected to the state of the back. And then we flip it around and do it real quickly the same way, but using the top to sample to read the A to D and doing front back to apply our ground at 3.3 voltages. Anyway, uh, and that that's all set up for you. So that's all that all that code's written and ready to go. Okay, so um, so here's your tilt table. Now this is actually my little tilt table I have here at home. It's slightly different than yours, and this is our old um, daughter bird board, but modified with our buck converter. So it's about the same, but yours is a little uh, it's, it's yellow basically instead of red. All right, so uh, and you can see mine's not connected with an RJ45 plug, which actually gives me lots of fits. The RJ45 is a much better way to do it. Um, and, and here's the battery power going in, and then that goes to your converter. It also goes to your, to your Viva board, or sorry, to your uh, KL25Z, which also has a, a, a voltage uh, a linear regulator on it, and, and basically converts it to 3.3 volts. So, uh, so the, the board's running on 3.3 volts, uh, we set this to 6.3 to 6.5 volts, so that's what's going to servo power. And these two connections here, then, the center pin gets the uh, 6.3 volts. Uh, the orange is your control signal, and then we have a common ground uh, in the black pin or whatever color it is, brown pin, I think. Um, make sure you don't unplug these things and plug them in backwards. That, that may cause problems with your... Uh, it could, could try and be grounding... Uh, your 6.5 volts through the servo back uh, to your AD input, or sorry, to your uh, uh, PWM output. That, that might cause problems with the, with the uh, with your uh, freedom board. So don't do that. We glued these touch panels down on on all your boards, and that worked a whole lot better. Um, okay, so now we have servos. This I think I labeled this one kind of wrong. So uh, so here's where your your freedom board sits underneath here. All the tables have freedom boards on them, and we've checked them out, and they all they all read correctly and work correctly at this point. Uh, so it should be fine. You power it. You connect it to your to your laptop or desktop with this plug, just like you always would, and that allows you to program it. It also is the pathway by which you can start up a terminal program and see output when you use a printf statement. And that's very helpful. You can also send commands to the freedom board through that port as well, through that terminal window as well. And, uh, and then all the other connections are automatically made uh, through the pins in this, uh, in this uh, 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 shield, I guess you could call it. All right. And uh, all, the, all the buck down converters have been set to 6.3 to 6.5 volts. If it starts reading high, so there's a, you can punch a button and you can read either the input or the output. So if you're reading the input, it should be 6.2 or 3 or 4. I think some of them even read 8 volts off the battery. Uh, but make sure you're reading the output and it should be 6.3 or 6.5. We have already set those, but you can change it by changing this little uh, terminal on the pot, this little uh, multi-terminal. Uh, I would encourage you not to mess with that. I think we have them all set correctly. They should change. Uh, but if you, do, if you feel like you have to mess with it, fine. But, uh, but it takes a lot of, it takes a bunch of turns and then all of a sudden you get to the point where it changes rapidly. And if you change it, if you drive it up too high, you might uh, burn up your servo. So be careful with that. All right. So each of the servos are in, in, on my tilt table. I mounted them up on blocks. I should have done that on yours, but I haven't. And I made my uh, elevation stand here in the middle a lot higher so that, uh, so this, so this U-joint is pretty high above, so you can you can get underneath here and actually work on the bottom of the table. Uh, but it takes longer push rods, and anyway, yours are already kind of set up much lower, and for now we're just going to live with that. Probably 
probably next year I'll, I'll take off all these blocks, screw on new ones, and raise the table up and get new push rods. Um, I have replaced all the servo horns, so yours has nice, nice metal uh, clamp on uh, servo horns. And we have uh, all these push tubes have uh, little uh, bearings in them so that they will they'll wiggle a little bit. One of the things that's not set up well on yours is some of them have a, an attachment point on this plastic block that's pretty far down, and since the table's not lifted up, it in the down position it can hit the servo. I've tried to move them all so they're outside of that, but but it's a little bit of a problem. And in addition, on my table on this, which I did, I built this after I built the 18 tables you guys have. Uh, I spaced this this control block exactly the same distance on the x and y axis so that the servos will turn the surface the same even though it's still not the same size it, it is rectangular so the x axis is longer than the y but at least uh, when the servo moves it moves it moves the table at the exact same angle for the same amount of motion of the servo uh, but yours are set up so that the x axis moves less and the y axis moves more because I did them on the edge which again because of the rectangular shape of the table, uh, it's hard to see it on this one, but anyway, it, it gets a little less play. All right, so uh, if there's too much, if the table's, well, first of all, I'll be gentle with these. Uh, the, the, the touch panel's glued on, so it shouldn't fall off and break, but if you bang something on it, you drop the whole thing, you're probably going to break the touch panel. So please don't do that. I don't have any replacements for these, and I'll have to scramble and figure out how to do it and I won't be able to use the RG45 connector probably because uh, I've never I haven't seen any other setup that way so try and be really careful just just handle with some care I don't I think it's all nice and tightly put together now so it should be fine but if there's too much wiggling you may need to tighten up the set screws in this universal joint notice here this this rod has to be fastened near the end if you just let it sit down on there, the rod will stick into the space in the universal joint and limit how much that, that universal joint can move. So you should see a clear space in the universal joint above this rod, and it shouldn't stick any more than what you see right here, just a hair into there. Um, there's a set screw on the top and the set screw on the bottom. The, the blocks under here, the, we, we ground the, we use nails, and we ground the head of the nail so that, so that it was and then it was hot and I'll get out and we push it into it here so that so that that nail uh, would be held by the block and, uh, and, and it wouldn't be able to rotate and I think they're all set up pretty well so if there is a little slack it's because the set screws get loose and and we have a teeny little allen wrench you can stick in here and tighten them be careful it's very easy to round off the end of that allen wrench or, or to round off your your set screw uh, and if you pull the set screw out it's easy to lose it because they're almost invisible Te they're teeny tiny and um, and so if you lose one let us let, let us know I will get you another one I have some extras don't go find in some wood screw and stick in there instead because that will definitely screw the threads up and then we'll have to change out the uh, the universal joint I do have some more universal joints if yours becomes uh, unworkable for some reason and we have more servos if your servo starts to really malfunction which they might uh, but I think now that we're running it off this buck converter at the specified voltage instead of through a one ohm resistor uh, I think we're gonna have a lot, lot less burnout servos uh, but be careful not to leave it on with the servos humming feel them every now and then to make sure they're not getting super hot okay um, so I think I this is let me yeah, and again, I our our X Y, the uh, our yeah that's the X direction. This is the Y. For some reason, this looks goofy, but that's how it is. So uh, this cable comes out, and the Y directions this way, and the X is that way, and then the servos are designated, and uh, I think we also put the designations on the new on the new uh, shield board down here too, so you should be able to see that. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, control theory. I, I'm not going uh, to spend a lot of time on this. I have, I have spent a bunch of time trying to understand it myself. And, and, and you need to take a control course if you're interested in this because it gets, you know, it's, 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 a, whole, it's a whole section of, of electrical engineering 
and computer engineering. So clearly, uh, control theory is a big deal. And it's not simple, it's not super easy, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. For the most part, in control theory, uh, we use the Laplace, uh, we use all Laplace transforms. So everything is in Laplace. And what's even worse, we never put in initial conditions, they're completely ignored, uh, because I guess we assume in steady state control that enough time has expired that the initial conditions don't matter anymore. Um, so what we have is we have a plant. The plant is whatever you're controlling. In our case, our plant is a tilt table with a touch panel on it, two servos, and the physics of, of the motion of the steel ball as it rolls around on the table, driven by gravity. So you could describe this, you could probably calculate this transfer function, but we haven't done that, and I don't know what it is. Uh, that is what, on my to-do list, but it's not easy. It's actually a, a lot of work. Uh, but uh, I'm planning on working with Bob Apollon in this summer. We're going to see if we can, we're really going to see if we can come up with the transfer function here. Uh, and we'll probably do a bunch of things to, to get at that by modeling the physics of the ball. Uh, we, we do have a little bit of a guess of the transfer function of the servos. It's not entirely linear, so that's a little problem. We will have to make linear assumptions about it. But, in, but, but this is our plant. This is the thing we're trying to control. All right. Now, um, this thing uh, generates an output. In this case, that's the position of the ball. And the ball is either in the center, where it's supposed to be, or it's somewhere else. Now, in this case, we're just going to do, this will control one axis, and then we'll have another controller for the other axis. So this could be our X controller. And so this is going to output, this is going to output uh, a control signal going to the servo to set the angle of the table. And, uh, and in, in for the x-axis. We take this output and we feed it back to the input. And at the input, we also add in our set point. Now, if we're, mo if we're changing the set point, then we wind up having to have a two degree of freedom loop control because we have to filter that and, and, and deal with how, how responsive to that we're going to be. But in our case, our set point is going to be constant. We're always going to want a set point of 1,000. And so if the table's at 1,000, the set point's at 1,000, we subtract 1,000 from 1,000, and we'll get an error signal of 0. But if the ball's not there, if it's, say, at uh, 0, then we're going to be off by 1,000 in the x-axis, and, and our error signal's going to be 1,000. If we're at 2,000, it's going to be minus 1,000. So we have to pay attention to the signals here. And when you write your code, you may get the signs wrong, and you'll have to go back and figure out if your signs are wrong. You'll know they're wrong because you will never be able to control the ball if your signs are wrong. You'll be moving it in the wrong direction. And one of the ways you can tell that is you can look at your tilt table, and you can, you can push on one of the corners, and that corner should go up against your finger to provide the correct proportional adjustment. And and if you're if it doesn't go up, then you're probably uh, you're you're probably got some signs that are wrong. All right, now we have an error signal, which is the difference between the set point and the current uh, the current position. Now this is a little tricky because what's really coming out here is uh, is our servo command. Uh, so there's, there's another little piece here that we're not really showing because we're, we're outputting a command to the servo. But, but the real thing we're playing with is the position of the ball. So, so I guess you could say that the, the, the servo signals, you know, is, is sort of not part of this equation at the moment, okay? What's part of this equation is the position of the ball and, uh, and the desired position and the and the difference is our error signal. All right, now that error signal goes into our controller. Again, the controller uh, will have a transfer function, and we'll see that in a second. And the transfer function includes uh, this transfer function of the controller and the transfer function of of the plant. And so we can change the transfer function of the controller. 
but we're stuck with the transfer function of the plant. It is what it is. Okay. Now, the the controller sends out a this actuation var variable uh, u sends out this actuation variable u, which goes into the plant to change the plant's output. Now, in this case, this is I guess it's a little 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 confusing, but generally you can think this this corresponds roughly to uh, to our, our server our servo uh, control signal, and then that servo moves and changes the angle of the tilt table, which then changes the position of the steel ball. And so we get a new position of the steel ball, we feed that back in, we get, we subtract it from the set point, we get a new error, we use that new error, we generate a new actuation command, and we uh, send that to the plant, which then generates, moves the ball around a little bit, and now we have a new position of the ball. Now, a couple of things to say about this. The uh, the actuation command uh, is it has real world limitations. You can only tilt the table so much. Gravity can only work so fast to uh, apply uh, a pressure to the ball. So if the ball hits the table uh, moving at a fairly high speed, it's going to flip across the table and go off the other side. The table's not going to be able to respond fast enough. So so we have some time delay in here. And we have, uh, and we have some limits into how much we can, to how, how, what the magnitude of this uh, correction factor can actually be. And this is this is actually interesting because uh, this is one of the problems with our controller. Our controller uh, might not know that it's exceeded the actual physical ability of the actuator, which is your servo, and so it may actually. Uh, it, it may continue to ramp this signal up, but have absolutely no additional effect. And, uh, and so that can, that can cause errors, and I think we call that, uh, call that, I think that's one of the wind-up errors. We'll talk about that. All right, now in addition to this, we have a couple of other uh, problems. One is we have a, an output disturbance. Our, life's not perfect. There are, there are little vibrations, there's, you know, a little air motion. And the truth is the steel ball uh, will move around a little bit. And so, so this, 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 this output disturbance will cause the steel ball to move and uh, means that then our wire will get screwed up even though our plant didn't change. And, and so now we have an air signal and now we gotta generate another actuator output and, and, and goes into our plant and, uh, and we, we hopefully will be able to correct this. Now, uh, there's another problem, and that is we have this uh, we have this load disturbance here. Now, this load disturbance uh, basically just adds a little noise to our con to our actuator signal going into the plant, and and it 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 can come from a lot of factors. Uh, One of the one of the factors that's going to where we're going to see some of this is our servos aren't perfect. They're noisy. Uh, they don't they don't when you give them the exact same command, they don't necessarily go to the exact same position. Uh, close maybe. Uh, some of them not even close maybe. Then if it's really bad, we'll replace your servo. But uh, but they're not perfect. And so what happens is uh, that actuator signal then is corrupted by some some inherent disturbance. It's not just noise. It's it's actually just it's actually part of the physical reality of your actuator, uh, and so so what goes into the plant is a summation of your U and your DI, your low, uh, sorry DI your load disturbance. So your DO your output disturbance and your DO your load disturbance. All right. So so this represents our our control system. We have a transfer function in our controller. We have a transfer function in our plant. We have an output that tells us where the ball is. 
We send that back. We have a set point that tells us where it's supposed to be. We get an air signal that drives our controller. We get an actuator output from the controller that drives the plant, and the plant sends out, uh, uh, does something to change the position of the ball, and we add to that a load disturbance and an output disturbance. Okay, so that's what we got to work with. And we write this in the, in the Laplacian domain as with the Laplace uh, variable s. But in, in control theory, we, we normally get rid of the s. We don't include it. And like I said, we never, do in, never include any initial conditions uh, because these are assumed to be steady state processes. Uh, so the initial conditions are ignored. Uh, and so that allows us to rewrite it and it makes a little more sense. We rewrite it like this. Our output disturbance plus, uh, and again, we're in the Laplace domain, so we can, we can sum up these transfer functions. So our, our output disturbance, which gives us the same effect of, of uh, well, we, we're convolving when we're multiplying and we're summing when we're adding here. Anyway, the, so we add the, the output disturbance uh, plus the uh, plant's uh, transfer function applied to the load disturbance plus the controller applied to the difference between the set point and the current ball position. So now we can rewrite this, multiply things out, we can rewrite it like this. That, our, that, our, that the ball position then is equal to our, uh, our output disturbance plus our plant's effect on our load disturbance plus the plant's effect on our controller's transfer function on our set point minus the plant's uh, transfer function times the convolved with the controller's transfer function convolved uh, with uh, our actual output. Our, this, is, this is the delta. All right, so now uh, we're, we're going to rearrange these for the control variable. So, because we have some y's here, okay? So we're going to rearrange it so that we have, have uh, the control variable y. And so when we do that, we basically put this term over here, and then we divide, uh, divide that by, uh, divide it by um, the PC. And we get y equals one all over one plus our plant and convolve with our controller times our output disturbance plus the plant all over one plus the, the, the plant and the controller convolved together times the load disturbance plus the plant uh, times the uh, 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 convolve with the controller all over one plus the plant convolved with the controller times our set point. Now, uh, so because these are interdependent, if in a standard system, if you're making adjustments to your set point continually, then, then, uh, then this term is important. If our set point's a constant, then this, this term, this term, uh, and that's why you can actually make the set point be zero if you want and just have a constant in there. And so you can basically get rid of this term. If you have to consider this term, then you basically have, in your one degree of freedom controller, you are unable, since the only thing you can change is your controller, uh, you, really can't, uh, you really can't minimize, uh, you can't optimize both these, both these uh, points. You, you, can only, you can only work to, 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 to optimize one of them. All right, and you'll notice here that's why you see this, this 1 plus PC term. Again, that's, that's the plant convolved with the controller transfer function. The plant transfer function convolved with the controller transfer function. Um, these give, these give uh, uh, whenever, if this, if this term goes to minus 1, then this denominator blows up to, you know, to infinity or undefined. And that, that causes the system to be very unstable, obviously. So that's what we don't want. And uh, 
And that, that drives a lot of control theory, this, this 1 plus this PC. And again, remember, we're in the Laplace domain here. All right, so we have these three terms, and uh, you can only change the controller, so you really, you can't, you can't, you, the only one you can really manage, uh, you can take your pick. You can optimize for this, you can optimize for this, but not all three. This one, though, is, is again driven by changes in set point. Now, here's where that one would come into play. Let's say you want to control the ball with a joystick, and you're going to move the set point with your joystick. Then that's going to, then that's going to, that, then you, then you, you're, if you want to optimize for responsiveness with the joystick, you're going to be changing the set point dynamically, and that's going to mean you're going to have to, you're going to have to go to the two degree of freedom uh, model. And you can add this second degree of freedom with this, uh, with this transfer function on your set point. And we'll call that f of s. And again, we, we, we drop all the s's. And, we, and here's what you get then. This f uh, shows up in, that, in this term. And since you can control f and c separately, you can now optimize, uh, you can optimize uh, this term and this term. All right. So, but our set point's always going to be, well, it's going to be this, it's not going to change, uh, so we'll just use a first order system. All right, now, I've been through the calibration. I think I'm going to skip here. Let's see. Okay, so just to remind you, I want you to do uh, this five point calibration. Now, I don't care if you do the 15 point or a nine point or whatever, but, but I would encourage you to consider doing. Uh, after once you get the five point calibration done, then go ahead and, and actually do the, the 15 point or the nine point calibration just for grins and rerun your MATLAB computations and plots and see how because you do where you really want the precision is is more around the center uh, as opposed to the points very far from the center. So and you can also change your linear coefficients, your your F sub three and your G sub three. Uh, you can you can add and move those around so that you can put your uh, so that you can put your your center point right on the center point if you want. All right. Um, okay. Now let's see. I think I think that's yeah. Now just for grins, um, we do have a little bit of an estimated uh, transfer function for the servo, uh, and the TS equals. 1,000 uh, divided by uh, S squared plus 75S plus 1,000. So, and you can see, you saw this and you can see where, where, uh, where this, this can go to zero. But the concern is when it goes to minus one. All right. And I forget. Uh, yeah, this is, and if you solve this, you get minus one fourth times these two things. All right, and I plotted a Bode plot of the servo, uh, and you can see it, it does have some phase problems and, and, uh, and it also rolls off. So, um, and this is radians per second. So uh, it, it, it's only, you know, yeah. All right, so um, a couple of constraints about the servo. Uh, so remember that the industry standard servo control is a 20 millisecond period, or 50 hertz. Well, I, I've changed that in your code, and you are sending a new command to the servo every 10 milliseconds, so that you're cutting that in half. And that gives you, uh, that gives you a, a better range of control uh, a better granularity uh, of precision for your for your servo angle, and you can sp you you the re useful range is something like uh, minus uh, or s from 75 to something like uh, about uh, I think uh, uh, 75 to 250 to 25 something like that 75 to 225, but Look at your servo, and you can see when you run your test, when you run the, 
uh, option two and you see the servo move around, you should play with those numbers until you don't have the servo moving. Uh, you keep it, you're keeping it into the range that it doesn't go too far and jam the, the, the plastic connecting block uh, from, your, from your table on, down onto the servo. So you, you want to limit the travel of the servo so it stays in, within bounds that are, that are really workable. Okay, and uh, so you can generate a new command to the servo every 10 milliseconds. Uh, if you send out commands faster than that, they're going to be uh, some only the one only every 10 milliseconds will the servo uh, actually assume a new position. So there's no point in sending a command any faster than 10 milliseconds. Um, and uh, and you could just call the there's a there's a function that sets the two servos. You just call it and it, and it sets them. But of course it's it if it's already just started a cycle, it's going to go through that whole cycle before it updates the new duty cycle. Um, all right. I think that's that's so largely the program structure. And I'm gonna I'll talk about that a little bit more. Maybe I, I may not I may have to do some of this next week, but hopefully this will get you started. And what my plan is, uh, I'll give you a little more guidance every week. So for those that are really struggling, hopefully uh, I'll, I'll give you a little more code and a little more help as time goes on. For those who are able to just uh, dig in and get it done, that's great. You'll you'll learn a little more. But I'm, I'm, we're not going to leave anybody kind of in the lurch just struggling. So we, we do want to help you. And uh, uh, but I have not written the code in MCE Expresso. I, I had it working pretty well in Code Warrior, uh, but I can't port that code over, so I'm, I have to start from scratch, and it's been a bit painful to do that. Uh, but the next thing I have to do is set up uh, something to give you a, a fixed interval so you can measure, uh, so you've got a good uh, delta time for your uh, differential term. But the first term you need to work with is your proportional anyway. Okay, so we'll come back to this. Okay, so again, this is the same thing. The, uh, the, yeah, here we, I guess here we t put the touch panel down here. This is a reasonable way to think of it too. So here's your, your servo is your plant, okay? And the touch panel is your, this is the actual position. This is the measured position. And then we have a, we have a set point of, well, in our case, we're gonna use a thousand, but it's a constant. and and then this measure position subtracted from our uh, our set point of a thousand gives us an error that goes into the controller. The controller sends out a servo command. The position changes. Our touch panel registers a new position, and we generate a new error. And around and around we go. So here's where your PID controller is. It it takes this error signal and generates a servo command. That's what it does. One for each axis. So if you think about it, we're, the PID controller involves the three things, a proportional signal, a differential signal, and an integral signal. Now it turns out for our tilt tables, they're all three sort of important. Uh, uh, for the cup car, we really only needed to use the uh, proportional and differential. The integral didn't, was not useful at all because steady state errors didn't really apply to the steering, uh, or at least not. Uh, if, I guess if you had different radius curves and problems with your uh, some built-in uh, uh, off-axis stuff with your steering, maybe maybe it could help you. Uh, but in general, you could adjust those things out, and it and it wouldn't be neat. But but in this one, we we prop we will use some integral term, but we're going to leave that for later. So for now, you can just set your integral constant to zero and you're not adding in any integral term at all. But we are gonna adjust the proportional and the differential. Now, here's the way the proportional works. The ball wants to be balanced in the center. Our error term is based on how far from the center the ball is. So here, the ball's way over here, so we've got a big error term. So that big error term multiplied by our proportional constant, we'll call that K, times our error term generates a change, a, ma a pretty maximum response to our touch panel, to our uh, servo. And our servo 
jacks up one side of the uh, of the uh, of the tilt table so that the ball is going to roll towards the center. And as the ball starts to roll, it increases its velocity. And as it comes towards the center, the air signal is going to go down and the command to the servo is going to be less, so it's going to shrink down. But now the ball is getting faster and faster because it's still rolling downhill. Now the ball is centered. Our air term is zero and our proportional, our proportional uh, air uh, control signal to the servo tells the servo to stay flat. Now that assumes, of course, that flat really is flat. And if it's not, then that, that's going to give us our constant error term that we can't fix with proportional differential. That's where the integral term is essential. Have to have an integral term. If this isn't really hard, perfectly horizontal, then we will have a steady state error. Uh, and the ball won't balance in the center. It'll balance a little off center. And if it's really not level, it may balance way out here or something. So we don't want that. So we do want your table working normally where, where when you're, when, 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 uh, when the ball's in the center, it's not subjected to a large angle. Okay. So now, but the problem is the ball still got some velocity. So what's going to happen? You guessed it. It's going to overshoot. And when it overshoots, now we're going to get an error signal that's got the opposite sign from the error signal that we had here. Okay. The velocity is going to be decreasing. The proportional, uh, the proportional correction which is the command to our servo is going to be the opposite sign, so it's going to drive the tilt table the opposite direction. Now, it doesn't matter whether, whether this is positive or whether that's positive. What matters is that this is one sign, and that's the opposite sign. And you have to make sure that, the, that, your, that your correction is correcting it in the right direction. That's what you have to make sure both for the proportional and for the differential. And it's easy to get a little uh, problem with your math so that, uh, so that you're actually aggravating the problem, not helping the problem. All right. As the ball continues to roll uphill, it slows down till it's almost stopped, but it's got a pretty good size air signal, so the table's going to jack up. And there it is, uh, about as tilted as it could be. And so now the ball's eventually, now it's stopped, it's going to start rolling back this way. And now, is, now it's coming down, and then it hits the center. Uh, let's see, did I do this right? No. Oh, okay. So you get the idea. Now, now if we do a proportional and a derivative, what happens is we have a, a large error signal, so we get a big correction. We start to get velocity. But as the velocity goes up, now the ball the ball is moving since the velocity is going up the first derivative which is how far the ball moved from here and we're just doing we're just doing a discrete derivative here so we have a delta time and and we're going to measure how much uh, how much how far the ball moved in that delta time and that's going to give us uh, a delta error and so that delta error is going to have the opposite sign of our proportional error. And that delta error then uh, is going to be multiplied by uh, our, our, our derivative coefficient and, and it's going to be summed with our proportional coefficient and it's going to start uh, opposing this large, uh, that it's going to try and slow the ball down and it's, even though we still have an error here, it's going to oppose that and it's going to result in, a, in the angle of attack going down, the angle of the table uh, decreasing closer to flat. And so as it gets to the center, it's slowing the ball down because now it may be that our differential term is actually uh, uh, overriding our proportional and the, the sum of these two gives us a net tilt of the table back the opposite direction. And when that happens, that slows the ball, so hopefully it's down to zero velocity when it hits the center and our error is zero. Now, of course, that's, that's, you know, that's probably wishful thinking initially, 
takes a good while to get to that point. Now, a couple of things to be said. A lot of this, a lot of the science of of, of uh, controls is uh, is looking at uh, modeling all this and plotting these out in these body plots and these not quiz things and uh, and and seeing what's stable, what's not stable, and and looking uh, looking at overshoot, trying to minimize overshoot. Uh, there are situations where what you want is a big response to quickly get close to your set point. So you know if you have that, you're going to get overshoot. But there may be other situations where overshoot is unacceptable. You, you can tolerate almost no overshoot. And there you're going to have to really uh, minimize your, your proportional control signal, and, and you're going to have to really have a fair amount of differential so that you don't ever let it go past. And so what you're going to have to do, you're going to kind of oscillate up to the, you know, to the asymptote as opposed to shooting over it and then oscillating along until you finally come back. So that's how control theory works. They spend a lot of time doing these plots and graphs and, uh, and, and trying to, to optimize the parameters of their control function that they want to optimize. And again, uh, it depends on what they're doing. And, and what the reality is and whether or not they can tolerate overshoot, how much overshoot can they tolerate, how much lag can they tolerate, uh, how much lag is in the system. There's a whole bunch of things. Uh, and of course that's control theory. All right, now, now initially when I first did this, uh, I sort of thought the integral term wasn't really important, but it turns out we do have a steady state problem if our tilt table is not perfectly level. And most of the time when we're using them, they're not perfectly level. And so if we have a little interval term, we can, we, instead of having to get out the level and make sure the tilt table is perfectly level every time we, we, we use it, we can actually uh, have a little bit of the integral term and we can take out that steady state error. Which means a steady state error is when the ball balances, but it doesn't balance exactly in the center. It's a little off center. That's a steady state error. And although it seems uh, hard, to, hard to mentally figure that out, uh, if you eventually think about it long enough, you will understand why the proportional and the derivative controls cannot uh, deal with the steady state error. Uh, I think I spent a lot of time. The, the thing that's kind of hint, interesting is the, the controller knows the ball's not in the middle, but it can't get it there unless you have an integral term. And that's just because of the way the proportional term and the derivative term work. Uh, they don't allow, you don't, they don't, they don't let you solve that, that equation. All right. Um, okay, so generally speaking, we, know, we need to do some things with our PID controller outside of our loop and inside of our loop. And I, I'm, I'm going to show, I, I'm going to show you some of the code I did before. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I use all these functions. Some of these are not ones I actually used. But eventually we set up an infinite loop. And, and what we do in that infinite loop, uh, we, we do a couple of things. Uh, so first off, um, we, we do have to get this delta time. And I don't have that implemented yet. So we're just going to have to assume a constant time, take a good guess at it. It won't really matter because Everything is kind of relative because you're multiplying it by a coefficient, and uh, uh, but but there will be variations in in the delta time between each reading, and that delta time is how you calculate your 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 uh, discrete derivative each time, and so that's if if the delta time is different every time that 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 is going to cause a little bit of error there, but it, it's generally not such a big error that it's going to screw everything up. Um, okay. Because it's because if we run this loop the same every time, your delta time is going to be relatively constant. Okay, so normally the way you tune these things, you start with a small proportional gain, and you increase it until you get into the ball is oscillating around. Now, if you're lucky, uh, you may even be able to keep it on the table with just proportional. Uh, although I have to say, probably not, because ours is not that big. But uh, but you may get close, and then once you get once you get it, you know, sort of rolling around on the table, uh, around around the center, but not staying there very well. Uh, then then you can 
then you can bring in a little bit of the derivative gain. And, and you start increasing the, the derivative gain until you see the oscillations kind of dampen. And then when they're, when, they're, when, when they're damped, then you can usually increase the proportional gain a little bit more. And you'll get a little more oscillation, then you increase the derivative. And eventually, uh, you get a fairly responsive movement of the table because you've got a pretty decent sized proportional gain in. Uh, but it doesn't overshoot and oscillate because you've got a reasonable level of derivative as well. Uh, usually, uh, yeah, you might find that a little increase in your proportional gain may cause a bigger increase in your derivative gain. And too much of either one is going to result in the instability, where it will oscillate and uh, continue to oscillate more and more and finally flip off the table. Too little of either is going to be uh, an adequate response to ball just roll off and the table won't really be able to, to stop it. All right, so that kind of, I think that covers most of what I wanted to say about the controller. Let, with Short of talking about the, uh, there are a few other things I could point out, and, but we're already in an hour, and I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna talk about the code just a little bit, and I, I may have to add some more of this next week, but I'd like you to, I'd like you to start to try and see if you can write the code. All right. Okay, so here's my code from, from before using code wire and all that. I just pasted it into Word here. So uh, a couple of things. I, so, uh, so these were some of the include files. You just can't ignore these. We're not going to use any of this. Here's my main routine. Now, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to put in the constants. Now, I, I've labeled them totally differently. And, uh, and I'll go over all that next week. And you can label them whatever you want. But you can see in, my, in, in, the, in the starter code I gave you, that I, I use different names. I use, you know, long, fancy names with a, they start with a G because they're global and all that. Uh, these are the, but these are the values that come out of your MATLAB routine, okay? You get, you get F1, F2, F3. These are going to be used to scale your, your, the raw X and Y value into a calibrated X. These are going to be used to scale your raw y value into a calibrated or your raw x and y value into a calibrated y value remember you multiply in in all th in both of these you're multiplying uh your raw x add into your raw y add into your translation same thing here so you notice here you get a lot of x and a little y here you get a lot of a little a lot of y and a little x and that's because this is the one for y, and this is the one for x. Generally, generally, x follows the raw x, and generally, y, the calibrated y follows the, the raw y. But because it's a little rotated, it's not quite true. And I, I showed that to you the last week in the, that lecture. And then, then you have, then you have, an, uh, you have an x, an x error, and you have an x interval term, and you have an x set point. And then you have somewhere in the code we have a a, a, a x uh, integral coefficient, proportional coefficient, and derivative coefficient. Here, my integral is uh, usually it's never it's like very small, uh, but we start off with zero for the integral coefficient, and uh, the proportional coefficient uh, is can be reasonable size, and then the but usually the derivative coefficient is larger. Typically. Okay, so anyway, and then you have you have your maximum servo, well, you're, you have a max x and a max y, and, and, and you have uh, your x output, uh, and then you save your last input, your, last, your x last input, and your x uh, derivative input, and um, your delta time. And then Then we have some floating values here, uh, and, and this and this is the y, the y set point, and all this, and uh, the y out max, y out min, um, and you always are going to check your position to make sure you're you know you're not reading something that's ridiculous. You just you want to kind of bound it. All right, and of course in in the in, in this code we had it all set up for the for the system tick counter. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to see if I can do that. I may, or I may do the peripheral interrupt timer. I don't know. One of these we'll do, and we'll have it, we'll have it updated by an interrupt. Um, 
And then we have our, uh, our, our X servo and Y servo values. So we have an X raw and a Y raw, an X cal and a Y cal, an X servo and a Y servo. And so these are the, so basically then, the first thing we're gonna do, and this is true in, in, in the, the MCU code that, that you guys have, we're gonna get the X, the X and Y raw values. Then we're going to use our, our equations uh, with our uh, three coefficients for x, and we multiply the x times the uh, f1, the y times f2, and we'll add in f3, which is our translational coefficient, and, and we'll get a calibrated value for x. We'll do the same with g1, g2, and g3 for the raw. And then, and then this, gives us, this gives us a calibrated x and a calibrated y. Uh, now, when we actually get these values, uh, our, our, uh, our A to D routine is actually averaging 32 samples. It's actually measuring, it, measuring the position of the ball 32 times. And, and then it's reporting that, that 32 times average. And so it's doing it pretty fast. And, uh, and it gives us an average value. And then we take, because remember, we can't, we can't update our servo anyway in less than 10, mill, in ten, less than 10 milliseconds. So we might as well take the time to get a nice, average, accurate position. Uh, even though the ball is moving, it's not moving super fast. And we're doing that in a fraction of a second, right? 10 milliseconds. So a tenth of a second. So, so our whole, our entire calibration process uh, calculations are all going to be done in less than a tenth of a second. In fact, they, they get done a lot faster than that. Uh, all right. So our X cal is just going to be F1 times the X raw plus F2 times the Y raw plus F3. Now I use different variable names, but it's the exact same calculation. And say, same for the Y cal. All right, and then uh, we may initially print something out. That will actually slow the, 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 the loop down dramatically. So you want to be able to, uh, you, you, when you're first getting done to make sure it's working correctly, you should print this out, but eventually you're going to turn the print statements off. Uh, what you might do instead is you might uh, you might use the RGB LED even though we can't see it because the board's covered up. But you can kind of peek under there and, and you can see it glowing. And you might have it have it be green when it's within you know a certain range of the center, or red when it's further out. I don't know. Anyway, um, you can use that if you want. All right, and then then we have. Uh, we're then going to uh, compare the raw to uh, uh, well this I put this in uh, so that so that if if it was getting a reading where the ball was lifted off the table that uh, that I would just level the table uh, but uh, we'll see if we can make that happen uh, so the one that what's a little bit tricky is this may not be uh, this may not be, it may not, it may not work well that way. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, maybe it will. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, I just use this to level it when there was no ball on the table. Uh, so assuming that there is a ball on the table, because our, our raw values are not greater than 0.855 in the X and minus 0.828 in the Z in the Y, uh, then that meant it was level. And again, remember, I'm using plus or minus 1 and not a zero to 2,000. So we'll see if it'll work, I don't know. Uh, I looked at the numbers and I thought that, that when there's no ball on the table, it, it still reads a value that could still be uh, a ball on the table. So um, I don't know, we may not be able to do it. All right, so here's the, X, here's the X PID controller and here's the Y PID controller. Now this is using the, the variable names that I, uh, I put up above and you're gonna have to change these variable names to the new variable names. And I'll, I'll put this code on the blackboard so you can look at it. So this is this is for the X, and then we do the exact same thing down here for the Y, okay? So, so here's the X, starting here. So we first have, we first calculate the delta time. And I think we don't count, oh, we do Y delta time too. Okay, so we do, we calculate the delta time for X and Y. Probably could just do it once. In any event, um, so we save the time, 
and uh, and we'd use that. We use this with this TFC ticker thing, and uh, and so we're not. We don't have this set up yet, so don't worry about this. You can just set this to a constant of one or something. Um, okay, then we have we have x error equals the set point minus the calculated x value. This gives us our x error. Then we take our our integral constant, and, and we're not going to use this initially, so you could even skip this at first, but eventually we'll want to come back and put this in. And we multiply the error times the integral term. And then we add that to our integral term, to our, to our x integral term. So here's our integral coefficient, our x integral coefficient times the error, and we sum that up to the integral term. Now that seems crazy, right? Now somewhere we have to initialize this at zero uh, before we start in this continuous loop. But once we're in here, we never zero this out again. We let this just, this continues to grow as, as long as uh, there's an error. So if the ball is not right in the center, there will be an error, and we'll be multiplying it by this interval coefficient, which will probably be 0 0.001 or something, so it's a fairly small value, and that's our interval term. Now, initially, we'll make this zero so that we're not generating any integral term. But then when we want to uh, get it, when you've got it working pretty well, and then you want to play with the integral term, we'll talk about, you know, adding, making this, this coefficient a little bit greater than zero, like maybe 0 0.001 or 0 0.01, no, something like that. And then we compare this integral term to our, to our maximum x out, and we make sure... Uh, that if it's greater, we limit it to the maximum x. And this is important because, remember, your controller doesn't know that what the physical limits are. And this is how you teach it, it's physical limits. And this, this prevents wind-up. So what happens is if you sit there with the ball not on the center for a long time, maybe it's just slightly to the right of center, then it's going to generate a big x interval term, which, uh, which we call wind-up because it's telling the servo to go maximum greater than it is, but it can't because uh, that's all it can do. And so, but the integral term will get greater and greater. And so, so then when it comes back down, it takes a long time before it gets back into the range where it can actually effectively control the ball. So we don't want, we don't want to let it grow when it's not having an effect. So we restrict it to this max. And then we also check for min. So we don't we want it between our maximum output and our minimum outputs. All right. So now we do the derivative term. Now our 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 derivative input is equal to our calibrated x minus the last x input divided by our delta time. And then uh, and then we compute the PID output. So Here's our final x output. It's x, uh, the, the proportional constant, times our error, plus this, this interval term, plus the derivative uh, coefficient, times this x, the input here, the derivative input, which is just the difference from the current calibrated position to the last calibrated position divided by delta time. And again, we'll start off with just delta time being a constant. But eventually we'll, we'll, we'll calculate that when I get the, uh, an interval timer working. All right. And then we check it to make sure that we're not trying to command the servo to do anything more than it can do. So we compare it to the maximum in. Same out here. And then finally, uh, we have to remember some stuff from, la from for the next time. So, so now we make the x last input our current calibrated x. We make our current servo command to be our, our new output command. And we save uh, the time in our system tick timer so that we can calculate a new delta time. Again, I don't have this implemented yet, but we will. All right, and now we do the same thing for the y-axis. And that's all there is to it. And then you can print that out so you can see what's happening. And then we send the new command out to the servo. And in this case, we we change the sign here 
so that uh, it's moving the servo in the right direction. And you may have to, this for you this may be minus and maybe plus, you may have to play with it. And we always have to go back through and check our signs and our math to make sure that, that, that what we think we're correcting, we're actually really correcting. All right, so that's how that, that's how that implements. I'll, I'll put this code, you can refer to it, uh, and all you need to do are basically change the variable names and use a constant for the delta time. That's all. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I haven't gotten the, the delta time thing implemented yet, but we will. And, and so when we do that, uh, it'll be a little more precise than it'll be at the start. And what you'll find is you start with intervals as interval coefficient at zero, derivative coefficient at zero, and a little bit of proportional and see what happens. And make sure that, that the ball is being, when you put it in one corner, the corner comes up and pushes it to the middle. Or if you put it on one end, at the X end, that the X end comes up and pushes it to the middle. If you put it on the top or the bottom, the Y come, uh, moves the correct direction to push it to the middle. And once you get that working, and you see the ball rolling around some, then, then you start, uh, you, you play with that proportional constant until you're getting a fairly reasonable response, but maybe it's, but, but the balls may be rolling off very frequently. Well, then you bring in a little bit of derivative and see if you can, see if you can begin to combat that a little bit, dampen it. And, and then when you uh, get it dampened somewhat, maybe the ball might, might even be staying on, just not very, you know, not, not really too good. And you just keep working from there. And uh, with any luck, uh, you can have the ball bounce nicely with just this setup. All right, uh, I think with that we'll stop and uh, I'll post this and I'll put this, uh, I'll put this, uh, this WordPad file on, uh, uh, on, on Blackboard and I'll, uh, I'll label it uh, um, old PID example code.